Hey guys, Hello. welcome back to another episode of The Weekend Hour. Bye. I'm your host, Kristen. And I'm your other host, Levi. <laughs> da -da -da. Da -da -da. Today we're going to be talking about the infamous Donner Party, which was a group of American pioneers who migrated from Midwest to California. And because of numerous mishaps... They ended up being stuck in the middle of a very harsh winter in 1846 to 47 in the Sierra Mountains. This was a pretty crazy story. I mean, I've known about this story for a long time. Actually, it was my dad that told me about this story because um, he used to live in the mountains in California and we were going for a motorcycle ride one day and we came across Donner Lake and I was like oh it's so cute and so pretty and he was like do you know what happened here and I was like no and he was like let me tell you a story yeah. and it just kind of been burned in my brain ever since it's just a really disheartening story and it kind of just makes you feel like I give so much credit to our ancestors about going through all the crap that they went the through. The hard life that they lived and yeah. what they were willing to do and give up just for a better life. Like my kids can barely survive without Wi Fi. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> and these people are like going it's very across the a country. Grounding story. Like, like um Yeah, it makes you feel good for what you have in mm -hmm. life and Yeah. They're definitely more badass than we are, in my opinion. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't think I could literally be in their shoes. I, I don't know. I don't know. Um. So what would you do to survive? Where would you draw the line? Would you be so desperate to actually eat? Oh, God, I hate even saying that word. Would you be so desperate to eat some of your family members or friends to survive? And this was the harsh reality the group had to face. So grab a drink, get cozy. Let's get into the weekend hour. Ba -da -da. Da -da -da. <laughs> All right, a little backstory. Living life in the mid 1800s was very hard. Many people lived hand to mouth existence, working long hours and often really rough conditions. There was no running water, electricity, central heating. Or Wi-Fi. <laughs> Wi-Fi. <laughs> Children stayed home with their families to help them on the farm or other household chores. James Reed, which is one of the main people we're going to be talking about, uh, was born November 14th, 1800. From, he was from Northern Ireland when his father passed away. He immigrated to the United States shortly after with his mother, and they lived in Virginia. In 1825, Reed moved to Illinois and was interested in mining and ran several businesses and was part of the Black Hawk War in 1832, who served with Abraham Lincoln. In 1835, he married Margaret Backenstow who was a widow with one daughter, Virginia Backenstow. After they got married, Virginia took um, his last name, Reed. Um, and she's going to be kind of important in the story because she, she, uh, she writes quite a bit of diary entries. So she's going to be a lot of the person that I'm going to be referring to. They had four children together, but one died as an infant. George Donner who was another main part of the story, was born March 7th, 1784, near Salem, North Carolina. He had three sisters and three brothers, one of whom accompanied him on this expedition. In 1864, Donner and his family lived outside of Springfield, Illinois, and at that time in history, it was common for people to travel west, discovering new land. The East and Midwest were being flooded with people from all over the world, immigrating, you know, from everywhere. 
and it was getting really crowded. So people were interested in expanding, exploring out further west, especially after Lewis and Clark made their discoveries of new land. Hearing of promised land in California and possible gold to be found made California a very desirable place to discover. On April 14th, 1846, George Donner and James Reed got together to lead an expedition 2,500 miles from Springfield, Illinois to California. That is a huge trip. I mean, they don't got cars. They got wagons. (laughs) Driving that trip is exhausting. I mean, we've made that trip. I mean, even further. A few times. That took quite a while. Um, I can't. I can't. I can't imagine in a wagon. I just can't. Accompanying them are their families and George's brother, Jacob Donner, and hired help. Each man had three covered wagons with drivers to drive the oxen that pulled them. Each wagon had different things. One wagon would be filled with food, the other clothing and supplies, and the other with beds, blankets, pillows. uh, Reed also had two servants, Eliza and Bailey Williams. They brought fancy food liquor and had built-in beds and stoves in their wagons they had quite the setup extravagant wagon compared to everyone else but the expedition would take about four months they thought traveling through the plains and mountains and in total there was 15 men eight women 16 children and nine wagons and they also brought other animals like horses and cows to milk through milk during their stops and what have you. So the first leg of the trip was to Independence, Missouri, where the Oregon Trail began, which was 250 miles from Springfield, where they started. In her diary, Virginia Reed wrote, Never can I forget the morning when we have bade farewell to kindred and friends. The Donners were there, having driven in the evening before with their families so that we might get an early start. The Grandma Keys was carried out of the house and placed on the wagon on a large feathered bed, propped up with pillows. Her sons begged her to remain and end her days with them, but she could not be separated from her only daughter. We were surrounded by loved ones, and there stood all my little schoolmates who had come to kiss me goodbye. My father, with tears in his eyes, tried to smile as one friend after another grasped in his hand at last farewell. Mama was overcome with grief. At last, the drivers cracked their whips. The oxen moved slowly forward and along the journey we had begun. Many friends camped with us on the first night. and My uncles traveled for several days before bidding us a final farewell. It seemed to be strange to be riding in oxen teams, And we children were afraid of the oxen, thinking they could go wherever they please, as they had no bridles. So if you don't know what a bridle is, it's basically the thing that you hook onto an ox to keep them tame so you know where they're going. So they had a bunch of ox that were just roaming freely, if you would. Mm -hmm. So on May 10th, they arrived at Independence and grabbed the last few minute items and started the trek on their journey on May 12th. Along their trek through Kansas, they ran into more travelers, and they joined the Donner's party. As they reached the Kansas River, per Virginia Reed's diary, they met their first Indians who owned and managed the ferry. She admitted admitted to being very scared because her grandmother had told them stories how her aunt was kidnapped and held captive for five years, and this made her very nervous to meet them. But they managed to pull their wagons and horses and cows safely to the other side of the river for a small fee, and everything went great. She was very grateful to them. So on June 16th, 1846, Tamsin Donner, George's wife, writes that they have reached the Platte River and 200 miles from Fort Lamy, which is now called Wyoming. They recalled that it was going much easier than expected, (laughs) 
so far. <laughs> so far. <laughs> yeah. At Fort Laramie, they met an old mountaineer who says, do not go through Hastings Cutoff. Mm-hmm. Repeat, do not. Which was a shortcut, quote unquote, that he just came from there and it wasn't a good idea and to stay on the regular route. However, this intrigued George Donner, who was recently elected as the captain of the expedition. He's then greeted by a lone eastbound mountaineer who shows them a letter that came from Langford Hastings, who was an American explorer and Confederate soldier, stating he has information on a shortcut and to anyone on the road traveling westbound to meet at Fort Bridger to get more information. Donner who was still intrigued by the possibility of a quote-unquote shortcut, decides to leave the travelers to Fort Bridger. Some families were against this and went to the regular route. Fort Bridger was still in Wyoming. It was about a six-day trek from Fort Laramie. Mm -hmm. What would you do? Like, I know you're trying to, you want to get there as you, I mean, they're trying to beat the winter. They yeah. already came off from a super late start in the season. They're running out of time. Someone says, hey, there's a shortcut, but don't take it. I don't know how your mind goes, mm, there's a shortcut? Yeah. I, <laughs> he I'm literally those, says, don't take it. I'm definitely one of those people that, like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, kind of. Like, yeah. hey, look, everybody's going down this. Mm-hmm. If it's too good to be true, it's probably not true like especially like, if everyone is still gonna want to go the regular route yeah. and you go off the beaten trail if you run into any problems yeah which we're gonna talk no about no one's later. gonna be really there to help you along uh, besides the people that are in your party but know, if that happened to me i would be like not nah, babe we're, we're going we're going right they can go left I mean, but how many times have we, like, gone somewhere and you're like, well, let's take this route. And you're all like, oh, my God, please work out. Please work out. <laughs> Not too many Luckily, times. Most of the time I'm like, do, I have but... a pretty good hunch. I'm like, hey, I'm pretty sure this goes here. Let's f- let's find out. It's been like one or two times I'm like, ooh, man, it's the... <laughs> this didn't pan out. Yeah. But. All right. When the Donner Party arrived at Fort Bridger which was just a corral with two cabins owned by Jim Bridger, who was a mountaineer. Bridger told them Hastings had already left a week prior, leading another wagon group through the shortcut, which takes them to Sutter's Fort. He also stated Hastings said there was plenty of level ground, lots of grass, and could easily cut off two weeks of traveling and gave them instructions from Hastings on where to go. The Donner party stays here for four days to rest the oxen and make repairs during this time. Other travelers arrive to learn about the same thing, like what's going on, there's a shortcut. Um, And they decided to team up with the Donner party. And at this point, They were in total of 74 travelers. On August 11th, they were slowed up by the brush and trees since there is now no road, no trail whatsoever. Others are starting to catch up and join the Donner Party. And now there's a total of 87 people and 23 wagons. On August 22nd, they reached Salt Lake Valley, and with only a month of summer left, they still have 600 miles to go. So they are starting to panic a little bit. On August 25th, a gentleman named Luke Halloran died from tuberculosis in George's wagon. They paid a few days to stop and honor him, burying him in a coffin under a tree. After this, they trekked on. About the same time, they find another letter left from Hastings warning them of a two-day dry drive, which means no water to be found. So they continued on following the track of Hastings' group after collecting as much grass and water as they could. But 
After five days trucking through Salt Lake Desert with no water, oxen decide to take off, never to be found again. A total of 36 head of cattle were gone and had to abandon four wagons. When they finally reached the regular California route, because the shortcut kind of like dipped down, I'll put a picture up, but now they're finally on the normal route. They realized they actually traveled 125 miles longer than the normal route. That would make me That's angry. so much further. Like, if it's like, like, don't get me wrong, I see some Google Maps sometimes, and it's like, hey, this one is like two minutes or whatever it is, but like, mm -hmm. the route itself is better. Mm -hmm. But 125 miles longer on foot, like, oh my God. get out of here, dude. So much for your quote unquote shortcut, dude. <laughs> right. I'd be so mad. Yeah. So like if you haven't read up on this, like basically Hastings was I'm pretty sure he was in lieu with uh oh my what was it? Bridger? Yeah. Like he was yeah. yeah. Hey, Bridger he was, was like, Hey, tell people to come this way, blah blah blah, you know, and mm -hmm. we can work together. And so Hastings was like, Oh yeah, I've definitely gone this route. Stop at this outpost and you're good. And then you show up and you're like Bro, this isn't a fort. This is like two cabins and some sticks. I left a lot of it out too. Yeah. It, I mean, obviously there's 125 miles of extra information. Yeah. But in a nutshell, they were literally had to cross a desert and there was no water. Oh, they yeah. had to abandon wagons, which contained food because a lot of their oxen just took off. So they had no, no you know, no animal to pull them. So, um, God, this was a huge blow. I would, if I ever, like, if I was those people and I saw that Hastings guy, I would walk up to him and be like, so much for your shortcut. You know? Like, yeah. It's so much longer. I, I think I'd oh, be it's, a little it's, upset. Yeah, it's only a two-day trip over a desert. Five days later, you're like, dude, I'm going to kill this guy. Well, and you're also starving Yeah, for water. I mean, not starving for water, but thirsty as hell. And he doesn't he doesn't make that known. I mean, there was, what, a little letter? No, he said he said Right it. before. Yeah, he said, it's oh, it's only, it's only two days. He said it was only two days, but it was five days. Yeah. So he was a little wrong. <laughs> wrong about everything. So this was devastating to them because it cost them food, wagons, oxen, time, when they knew that they were rapidly running out of time uh, before winter hit. So now they're angry, hungry, exhausted, to the point where James Reed gets in fight with one of the other travelers. They get, like, entangled up with their oxen, and James gets annoyed and the other driver stabs him in the head with the handle of his whip. And the handle actually gets stuck in his skull, bleeding. <laughs> and so James grabs his freaking knife and stabbed him in the chest. Which is crazy. I think they were just so upset with each other. Right. And that guy ended up dying um, yeah, nice pretty, chest. pretty soon. <laughs> so uh, this pissed a lot of the other travelers off because James just killed someone out of rage. And they actually even talked about hanging him. But they were probably like, I don't got time for that. Yeah. <laughs> not so they ended up just banishing him from the group and he had to go on his own. He had to leave his children and his wife to go by himself. So on October 11th, the Paiute Indians killed 21 of their oxen and still 18 more and injuring several others. In total, the Donner Party has now lost over 100 head of oxen. So like, this just kind of blows my mind. If they've lost 100? So how many? Do, how I many forgot to look this up. With, yeah. yeah. I don't know if I found this, how many they actually started with. But could you imagine, you know, 10 wagons and... 300 no they got 23 wagons yeah. now 23 wagons and who knows how much how many oxen are we like well not much was left so we do know that <laughs> that's just a sight to see so on october 16th they reached the 
Truckee River, which leads them to the Sierra Mountains. This is where things start to go badly. Their food is almost gone. The weather is becoming very cold. So everyone is exhausted, but fear winter is about to come soon, so they continue pushing on. Then George Donner's, Donner's axle breaks on their family wagon and has to stop to make repairs. He ended up cutting his hand severely and with a wound like that in the middle of nowhere with hardly any medical supplies. It's not a good outlook for him. Mm-mm. Just imagine on the trail thousands of miles away from anybody and you just got basically lost a hand. Like, yeah. Very detrimental Mm -hmm. to anybody. So by November, the snow was falling all around them. They were in feet of snow, traveling through canyons, having to hoist wagons up with ropes up ridges, disassembling, reassembling the wagons. Passes they couldn't get through, so they had to turn around and try another way. So much for this shortcut. Right. Ah, just... So it was very time-consuming. They were freezing and didn't have any food to burn, and all the calories that they were using were going to waste. They ended up at Truckee Lake. There was no way around it or through it after several tries. As more and more snow piled up, making it roughly five feet deep. Like, that's as tall as I am almost. Like, it's crazy. So a few... It's <laughs> almost as tall as you. Okay, so it's shorter than me, yes, but I just imagine... Trying to take your wagon through snow as tall as your kids. Like, yeah. Nope, not happening. Yeah. So a few men traveled ahead on horses to try to scope out the area and find a way through. But the snow just got deeper and deeper and they had to turn back. Well, yeah. I mean, that would be hard for horses to even get through. Yeah. That's hard Five for feet. anybody to get through. Yeah. Like, So they had already traveled 2,500 miles and were only 150 miles away from Sutter's Fort. They decided to stay at the lake and make camp there. One family took shelter in an abandoned cabin on the lake. Others made lean-to shelters, brush shelters. Some built shelters along the boulder, boulders, and some just put up tents. So this is why, like, I can not imagine trying to build a shelter in five foot snow like i've been out in the rain go camping and it's like coming in sideways and like oh man i gotta put up a tent or like yeah i'm a little bougie now so we have a camper (laughs) right like even just trying to like hook up the camper even hauling the camper through um what was it arizona Arizona, yeah in the winter time that was tough yeah i was in a truck imagine a freaking wagon dude and there's feet of snow like dude Uh. Tony, Man. our ancestors were just, they look at us now Tough like. Tough as nails. They'd be blown away by our technology, but like, you guys are bitches. Right? <laughs> what do you mean you have three meals a day? We led the way for you and you yeah. guys. <laughs> Gosh. Like. You guys have campers now? <laughs> yeah. Like, could you imagine, like, building a tent or a shelter? Like, hey, me and you and the kids, I know it's snowing out sideways, um, but this is where we're going to stay for the next couple months. So. Let's set up camp. No, I can't. Like, I get upset when it's like windy. I'm trying to set up a tent. <laughs> well, yeah. And then and snow. How are you going to get like dry wood for a fire? Yeah, I don't. Or to cook anything. Like trying to find dry wood. It would be near impossible. Yeah, there's. I don't know how they did it. I don't either. Like they're magicians. Anyways. So Patrick Breen, who was one of the travelers, wrote in his diary, came to this place on the 31st of the last month that it snowed. We went onto the pass, the snow so deep we were unable to find the road. When within three miles of the summit, they turned back onto the shanty on the lake. We now have killed most part of our cattle, having to stay here until spring and live on poor beef without bread or salt. It snowed during the space of eight days with little intermission after our arrival here. So let's show up, build a tent, and it snows for eight days. Dude. I don't know how they didn't freeze to death, to be honest. I just just can't. Yeah. The group at camp are fading and fading fast. After three days of zero food, 
they become desperate. They consumed all their oxen at this point, all their hides, pet dogs, field mice, and even leather shoelaces. A group of 15 people, including some women, decide to look for help using handmade snowshoes. They were called the Forlorn Hope. They knew it was going to be tough, and they chose only the healthiest and fittest people to go. After days of making the journey using the snowshoes, Jacob Donner and three others decide to stop. They had no more energy left. They had frostbite on their hands and feet. They couldn't breathe, and the sun beaming off the snow burned their eyes. They couldn't take it anymore and ended up perishing off the side of the trail. This gave the other members of the Forlorn Hope an opportunity to feed themselves and keep going. This was the first act of cannibalism for the whole Donner Party. But this was not the worst crime. This made things worse because a man named William Foster, who was one of the Forlorn Hope group, then killed two Native American Indians that were helping. He shot and killed them and wanted to bring them back to the camp to feed them to his four-year-old son, who we later find out by the time he got back was already dead and was cannibalized by the group. That's just wild, dude. Like... I don't want to interrupt. No, earlier. I think that's literally just kind of karma. Like, hey, I'm going to kill these two guys yeah. and use them as food for my family. Let's just start with like. And then you find out he was already killed and eaten. Before we jump on the deep Ugh. end of eating people, like, imagine killing our dogs. To no, for I can't. Food. That's why I was you like, know? pet dogs. Like, I, cu- I couldn't even do that. So, like, Hey, come here, Jackie. Whew. All right, we got dinner, boy. No. Like, no, 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 no. Like, there's not that much meat on dogs. No, he's literally a dogs. family member, so I could not. And, like, eating leather shoelaces? I mean, I might do that. I might But try, I'm not yeah. going to, like, kill. And they have no salt, so it's just, like, straight leather. Like, no flavor. No. Oh, my gosh. But then eating somebody... That's just, it's not the first time. And it's not the last time. No. I guess you got to do what you got to do to survive, man. But that's what makes you question it is how far are you? Like, what's the point? What's the crossing yeah. point? Do you think everybody has that, like, survival instinct? Or do you think some people are just going to be like, oh, I'll just freaking die. I don't even care because I'm not going to go out eating. Well, I'm sure there's some that are like, I'm not going to eat. I'll find something else and then they die. There's some that are just like, I don't care no matter what, I'm going to survive. That's so crazy. On December 24th, the day before Christmas, back at camp, they were consuming leaves, bark, twigs, anything that could sustain them. But there was nothing enough. They all agree to kill one of the members for food. They pick sticks to decide their fate. One man lost named Patrick Dolan, but nobody can stand the thought of killing him. He was 31. He was cheerful and fun loving, but a storm blew through and the fire went out. They all ran for shelter to stay warm and Patrick thought he got off the hook. I mean, yeah, I would too. Like, you would sign. think that kind of ended things, and you're like, okay, I might be safe for another night. But he ended up dying two days later of hypothermia, and they used his body for food. Okay, I don't to play devil's advocate for a second. <laughs> like, you gotta think, like, these people die. It's so cold, like, their body's not gonna, like, rot, it's just frozen. You know, so I was like, 
There's also <laughs> a line like, would you kill someone specifically knowing you're going to eat them? That's a tough one. Like if he's or already dead. if they're already dead, does that make it a different situation? Okay, this is going to sound jacked up, but like, do you think it tastes different if it's dead versus killed somebody in the fresh? <laughs> I don't know. I'm just saying like, hey, like. I think that, no, I'm talking about like consciously. Do you think people would be like, okay, I could probably eat this person now because I didn't kill them? Yeah. I think that probably has to do a lot with it is like, I didn't kill them. They're already dead, so I might as well make use of it. Yeah. But like. Ugh. I wonder if the meat tastes different between killing oh, and I don't want to think of that. That's <laughs> so gross. It's kind of like an animal. Like you kill an animal and you cook it right away versus like, oh, shit, it's dead. Let's eat it. Yeah, but dead but frozen. Obviously, it's not going to go bad. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think I got no salt and pepper for this thing. It's just straight human. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to puke. <laughs> Trying to get through this. <laughs> Stuff. <laughs> They got no seasoning salt for this. Bang! <laughs> no, it's like, trying to make light of a fucked up situation. Oh, it's so Sorry. terrible. A messed up situation. In February, John Sutter, who was a Swiss immigrant and owned a mini empire enslaved by the local Indians to work his land, offered to pay $3 to anyone who was trying or anyone who was willing to try to rescue the travelers stuck on the mountain. Many other groups organized a rescue mission, but it would take months to get to them because of the extreme conditions. At this time, the forlorn group gave up. They were too defeated to carry on, but one man, William Henry Eddy, kept going. Not realizing rescue was only six miles away from him. And after 33 days of hiking through the snow with handmade snowshoes and frostbite, he finally found rescue at Johnson's ranch. They immediately rescued the other members of the Forlorn Hope group, but only seven survived out of the 15. Jeez. Eddie was hailed a hero for this, and rightly so, because if he too just gave up, they would all be they dead. They all would have died. They all would have died. Eddie was only 28 years old, married, and had two children. But sadly, by the time Eddie got back to the lake group, his wife had already died. How sad. It's like, you so much of a badass. You carried on and saved people. Let's go back and get my family. And now. Well, at least his two children were still alive. Yeah. Hopefully they didn't eat their mom. They did. Oh, they did. Yeah. But the thing is, the children didn't know. Yeah. No one's going to tell no them. No one was going to tell them yeah. that you're fucking you eat eating your mother. Eat this meat. Yeah. I think that's actually. See? I don't know. Would that be a good thing of like. You don't tell them. You don't tell them. See, this is why thick thighs save lives, you know. <laughs> In case something happens, you know. If like... I die, you got plenty to eat. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> no, I'm just. <laughs> They they save lives. <laughs> Is that where the saying comes from? No, it's not. Better not Doesn't be. it come from a daughter? All right, so moving on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now when I hear that, that's what I'm going to think about. My husband uh, chomping my thigh. <laughs> <laughs> Sicko. Can we just take a bite out of you? Yeah. Oh, this is so messed up. Okay. Sure, it'll taste pretty good. All right, so do you remember James Reed? So he was banished from the group. Well, he all he made it all the way to Sutter's Fort, long before the snow even started. While he was there, he gathered as much food and supplies as he could, and ironically, helped the Donner Party during a rescue mission. I just find it pretty awesome that he gets stabbed in the head, 
then stabs the other guy, but because the other guy died, he's now banished from the group. So he makes it to Fort Sutter in no time because obviously he's on a horse with no wagons, nothing else holding him back, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. But at this time, the Mexican-American War is going on, and he fights in the Mexican War. The United States wins the war, and he recruits some of the soldiers to help him. He gets food and supplies and helps rescue the Donner Party's at Sutter's Fort. At Sutter's Fort. So, that, yeah, that is pretty crazy that so he imagine, has to leave the group. Yeah. And he makes it to Sutter's Fort. Mm -hmm. And then he has to freaking join this war that is literally happening at the same time. They win the war. And now he's recruiting for help. Could you imagine, like, that's just the circumstances to it is pretty wild. I mean, he did have his family still back at Donner's party, so I'm sure that was a huge motivating factor. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, you'll continue reading on. Pretty good guy, I oh, think, yeah. in my mind. So you get but... banished, and then... So there was a total of three rescue missions that took over two months to complete. The first rescue mission was in February and consisted of seven men from Sutter's Fort. It was a slow and dangerous mission... Snow around them was at sometimes 30 feet deep. Mm -hmm. They kept having to lighten the load of their packs by leaving food. Like, how would you? I know it says this, but like, man, all right. We got to load, offload some stuff. Let's get rid of food. Essentially. Well, because they're freaking drowning in the snow. That's true. It's 30 feet deep. And it's getting tiring very quickly. So by the time they get to the lake camp, they barely had any food left to give them. They offered to leave the strongest back to the fort, which was about 23, and sadly, many of them did not make it. The second, res the second rescue mission was attempted by James Reed. As the first rescue group made their way down the other side of the mountain, the second group was going up the mountain. James sees his family for the first time in five months. Still determined to rescue his other two children back at camp, he continues on. He ended up saving 17 people, including his children and some of the Donner's family. During the last and final rescue mission, George Donner ends up dying from gangrene and from his wound on his hand, but his family was rescued. 45 people out of the original 87 members of the Donner party survived. 32 of them being children crazy right that's wow dude so and this so party are freaking tough like you would think that they'd be fragile and like couldn't survive but to see so many of them survive is just awesome right, because they don't have a whole lot of meat on them to stay warm yeah and no one's gonna kill them to eat like, right but i wonder if maybe not telling them what they were eating was the way that they survived oh it had to have been like because the parents are gonna be like oh i know this is from john like I can't the, stomach yeah. it. The or... kids are going to be like, oh, it's food. Just, right. Oh, I don't taste good. You just got to eat it. Yeah. You got to eat it, you know? But, like, obviously they're going to have, like, some at the time, but they didn't mm -hmm. know about it, like, mental disabilities, like, traumatized. Permanent frostbite. There's frostbite, right? Like, malnutrition, you know? Yeah. But on the flip side, though, on the flip, flip side, <laughs> one infant side. actually <laughs> did survive, and that infant wasn't oh, even infant survived. One, in, one years old. That's crazy. Like, so here's my kind of thoughts. Do you think it. it was because like it was being breastfed at the time? So that was like one way it was surviving. Could be. But what if the mom died? I mean, we don't know who this infant is. Okay, so. this is like big group of people, right? They're going to be like, you know, women and children first kind of thing, sort of ish mm -hmm. to feed, you know? So yeah, there's 45, I think out of those. We have to make sure the kids survive, you know, and keep a couple parents behind. Like, hey, the mom is breastfeeding. We'll feed her. Yeah. She'll take care of the kids. Yeah. The men will kind of just waste away. But the men, yeah, they eat so much to sustain. They're just going to waste away. Like, and I'd rather. And that's what happened to the first few men that yeah. were on the snowshoeing group. They couldn't, snowshoeing group, they couldn't keep going and they just freaking died. See, sometimes it doesn't pay to be a big six foot seven, three hundred pound dude. It's true. <laughs> I mean, if you're gonna eat them, sure, but to 
Survive with no food? Yeah. It's going to be tough. It's just such a crazy story. Um, I mean, that was pretty much the gist of the story. I mean, you could go on and on about the things that they had to go through. and oh, there's But it, it was so it. disturbing. We couldn't really go in too much detail. That was that was pretty much as PG as I was going to keep it because yeah. I don't know if kids are going to be watching this show. But it's just, I don't know. The things that they freaking went through, unbelievable. And um, it's kind of like a recap, right? So we left going to the West, right? Mm-hmm. Do you think we would have took the quote unquote shortcut? Like a newly discovered shortcut? I think I would, but if I ran into somebody that literally told me do not go on this route, yeah. I wouldn't have done it. He's not going to say that to benefit him in any way. Yeah. He's literally trying to tell you don't go on this route. I think. And he does it anyways. So I don't know. I think once it started. And like... being held like the captain, like you got to make that decision. And I think that he was just too. I think he just wanted the journey to be over. Yeah. He was done. And he just wanted to risk the shortcut and ended up killing all these people pretty much. Which is crap. So I was, he was like 50 something years old. All right. So 1846. So 46. Donner? Mm -hmm. He was 60, I think. Yeah. Imagine a 60 year old dude mm -hmm. making this truck. Like, that's gotta be hard. That's wild, man. Yeah. So I think if we would have done it, I don't think we would have took a shortcut. We probably would have been like the other people like, no, we're going to go with this other group that's on like the main trail and be safe. Mm -hmm. Rather be safe than sorry. Right? Yeah. All right. So hypothetically, we took the other trail with the people. Do you think that maybe this shortcut was a shortcut, but maybe weather, unexpected weather kind of came through? No. And I mean, I don't think so. I think it was 125 miles more. Yeah. Right? Like. But they were in like five feet deep of snow. To me, 125 miles is 125. Like, yeah, that's if true. you're going, if the original route is like this, right? And your 125 is like this. Yeah, I it guess is, it is quote unquote miles quicker is because it's still like straighter. Even if it's 125 miles, miles sure. Yeah. But there's no freaking, there's no freaking way. Yeah, no, it that was, makes sense. It was freaking, like, oh my gosh, the shortcut was not that a guy should have been held responsible. Yeah, but anyways, that was the story, you guys. Um, what are your thoughts? Let us know in the comments below. Um, if you haven't subscribed yet, give that button a little clicky click. Oh yeah, <laughs> full send. Do it. Like and, us. We have um, videos. Hopefully every week, you know, some random we're, stuff, we're, we're some pretty it cool work. stuff. <laughs> Sorry, my bad. We're still figuring out what we're doing if you haven't figured that out. Yeah. Anyways, but that's it for today, guys. So we will see you for our next video next week. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good one. Peace out. All right. Bye, guys.